it is another edition of the on the mic podcast and uh i don't like to just throw this out there right away but like dreamless bucket interview crossed off right now my next guest first off congratulations on the engagement i've already voiced multiple times on social media that she is a future should already be in the hall of fame she'll be making her return uh, for her second stint in the UFC this summer, she is the one and only former UFC women's bantamweight champion, Misha Tate. Misha, how are you? Hey, I would say I'm doing pretty good, honestly. I got surprised yeah. with an engagement, so very excited about that. And the training camp is progressing beautifully, so a lot of good things in the works for me. Yeah, absolutely. And the first thing I want to talk about is just away from fighting, away from kind of what everyone knows you for. And, and that's just just being... First of all, just a symbol for moms, right? You just got engaged and they say, once you have kids, like you lose everything, which is really messed up in society that that we have this notion of that for for women. But here you are about to make your second stint in the UFC. Two kids just got engaged, uh, VP at one. You are the most busiest mom on the face of this earth, hosting a Sirius XM show weekly. Misha, how do you do it? And do you know just how much influence and motivation you give other women and other moms? No, but it, it's nice to hear, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad that by doing what I do, that it can maybe make a difference in someone else's life. That's, I mean, that's always the, the, um, topping on the cake, I suppose, you know, the, the cherry on top is like, if you know that you can make a difference in someone else's life and make that better, it's, it's great. You know, it's, it's obviously not the reason why I do this stuff, but to hear that is like, wow, you know, it's, it's pretty neat to know. So I always enjoy hearing the stories of maybe how, how it has helped or inspired somebody. But um, yeah, I would say I'm pretty busy. I unfortunately I had to resign from my position uh, with one championship. So but I mean, it's a good thing because right there was too many hats for me to wear. I've got to focus on being a fighter and being a mom. Those are the things that are taking precedence right now. And uh, I want to make sure to do this the right way this time around, as opposed to you know, the first time around, I just think there's so many things I could have done better. And this time around, I want to nail it. Well, to that point, I think there's there's usually two different from the from the fans outlook. It's the, the female fighter and then all the sexist comments. Or then there's a female fighter who's a mother. And it's like, well, she's kind of lost it. She's a mom now. When yeah. you see those things, and, and I have to give you so much credit because I was listening yesterday to MMA Today when you were talking about how the engagement with Johnny went down and, and just how everything yeah. was. And then you reflected on the first date. And, and I was talking to somebody who's followed your career for so long as a woman. And, and she was like, I just felt that moment to be so powerful by Misha to be like, yeah, this is how the first date was. And we we're running through the restaurant. And I was like, it's so amazing because you just kind of break down that wall and narrative of, she's a woman or she's a fighter and she has to talk this way and think this way. Why do you like breaking through that wall and that narrative? And you're just like, I'm a woman. I can have my own wants, needs, and desires. And I can also speak about it the same way in which men can speak about things. Like, I think there's never been a time in history where people can look like they're living a life that's so different than what they're actually living. And I think it's important to let our younger generations know that we're human too and that what you just see on social media is not it's not always an accurate depiction you know there's always a conversation to be had with somebody you know so don't judge a book by its cover and and don't get carried away that anybody's life is perfect there's no hollywood movie star there's no uh perfect life there's no perfect person there's nobody even if they seem famous or that what they're doing is just so great and their life must be just perfect you know or or even just me getting to share that story of the insight just letting you know that I'm a person I'm a person I'm a human being I have needs wants desires I have uh funny moments I have sad moments you know um, and I don't share, you know, everything of my personal life on social media, because I also don't think that that's the place to do that either. But I just think it's important to be transparent and open in, in a time, especially when I think young girls and I'm sure young, young males are looking at what they feel like is the expectation. You know, what, what, you know, there's all the Instagram filters now, there's all the things that make you think if you're not that, that you're doing something wrong. I definitely want people to know that that's, 
it's that's not the case you know that that we are people just like anybody else like put our pants on one one leg at a time regardless of what you may think that we are or we do uh we're human beings so i really enjoyed getting to share that story and just kind of shed some some insight and some light on how johnny and i really came to be because it was definitely very unexpected and i would actually say like i was definitely leaning away from that just because he was somebody who trained at the gym. And I was just like, there's no way that I'm going to date anybody from the gym, not going to happen, you know, but we had passed each other for years. And it's just crazy to me to think that my soulmate had been in the same, you know, room as me multiple times. And I just never even crossed my mind, barely had a conversation with the man. And then you meet under a different setting and you could really connect with somebody, you know? So I really did enjoy getting to share that story. No, it, it was beautiful. And honestly, I think it's the one way that <laughs> me and many people could be like, hey, we relate to Misha in a way. Like you yeah. never know who you're meeting or who you're passing by or who you connect with. And if on a first date, you're running through the kitchen of a restaurant, like then you're doing the right thing. I know, uh, it was so funny. <laughs> it, it really was. And, and honestly, it's one of those moments that I feel like it's why I got into the sport to, to see the human side of fighters it's why i do these interviews and i don't talk about the game plans and the techniques and all that it's just getting to tell the stories of fighters and and women and men as they are as people not just as fighters and, and with that being said like five years away and you know the narratives and i don't have to say them five years ring rust this that why is she coming back we hear so many times they're coming back for money they're coming back for this when you announced your comeback and you went on your show on mma today on sirius xm fight nation you were like I'm coming back to be a champion again. What has changed and what did you kind of go through the, through those five years where you were just like, yeah, I'm coming back for all the right reasons and I know where I'm at? Well, it was uh, in part to the pandemic, of course, making a slow down and making me reevaluate what I really wanted out of life. And, you know, being isolated in Singapore where the borders were shut, we couldn't go out, nobody could come in. I just realized how important family and friends are. I realized how important dreams and goals are. And I realized how important time is. And I just started to sit back and look at all of that and say, what do I really want right now? What is it that I want? Because I've got a pretty good situation here, but I'm feeling like something's missing. And I think it's important to have those conversations with yourself. I think all too often people neglect themselves. You know, they, they don't stop and take the time to ask why, you know, if you're feeling down or this or that, you know, sometimes people just accept that as that's the way that it is. That's the way it's got to be. And I just am very reluctant to do that. If something doesn't feel right or something feels like I should be going a different direction, even if it's not that it feels that I'm in a bad place, you know, because I wasn't in a, in, a, in a bad place. I was in a good place, but I just felt it wasn't the right place. And I started to ask myself what it was. And it just that little fire just started to burn brighter and i was just like try to like no you know misha you're just hormonal right i just had a my baby so it was just like no you know you're probably just but no nope. it was uh it was definitely the the burn to want to compete again to want to um pursue those dreams and goals and i think it was the perspective in hindsight of how much better i thought i could do the second time around because I just didn't have the support system the first time. I did not invest in myself. I did so many things that took away from me as a whole person and what I really feel like I could have done. And I still became a world champion in spite of, and I'm like, what can I do now under the right circumstances? So I, I'm curious, I'm genuinely curious to know what I can do, what goals can I reach? Because I think when I set my mind to something, and now under the right circumstances to support my crazy ambition that I could really do amazing things. I think the MMA world is excited to see what you can do during this second run. But something I really wanted to ask you was how important is, I don't think, not you, but I think a lot of fighters shy away from what you just said. Everything behind the scenes wasn't where they should have been during you know, your first run with the UFC. Okay. Now everything is, and I think some people be like, oh, you know, I needed some time away, blah, blah, blah. They won't really dissect it and really dive into what that was. So how important is it for you to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I need everything outside of the case to also line up with what I'm doing in the gym 
so that I can be my best self in the fight. That's, that's everything, to be honest. Um, and it's not to say that if you are stubborn enough that you can't still make things happen, but I mean, obviously I think I'm living proof of that, that I made things still happen, but, but if you truly want to be the most successful version of yourself, especially in a business that like fighting, it's violent and you can really get hurt. I think it's just a wise approach, a much wiser approach to be introspective and to take away the things that don't add to you and to add to put in the things that do. And I never realized it until I was looking back, right? They say that hindsight's always better than foresight. You can kind of gain so much. Then you stop and ask yourself the questions and that's what it is. And having that internal dialogue, I think is very important. Slowing down, the force slow down kind of made me reevaluate everything again. And I just said, physically, I'm right in that moment. I just had my second child. I hadn't competed between the two of them either. So I never really got back into that fight shape. And I thought physically, I'm probably the furthest I've ever been away from attaining that goal. But mentally and emotionally, I'm the closest. And I believe that the body follows the mind. And I had just made that, made that decision. I made that up in my mind. And I said, I will get my body there and the body will do, you know, Michelle Watterson, she was a guest on our show just last week uh, on Sirius XM shout out channel 156. If you guys are yes. listening on Wednesdays, appreciate you um, on MMA today, but she said, the body will do what you ask it to. And I, I love that because I think so many women just after they have a kid, they're like, oh, you know, my body changed or, oh, and it's true, your body changes and some things may never be exactly the way that they were before, but I think you gain so much on the other side of it, you know, that the confidence that I have now that I've built two human beings, I've made children, like, I'm like, I'm a badass. Like I did that. I made babies. I made people like, I just feel so accomplished. And I, I believe in my body's ability to do what I ask it to more than I ever did before. So, you know, and, and getting back into that fight shape has been such a fun journey for me, seeing the physical changes and seeing myself chisel back out to the fighter that I was before lean out and everything has been so fun for me. So it's a different, it's a different journey this time around, but a lot of things are, I think in a much better place for me mentally, emotionally, and, and physically, you know, I'm asking my body to do it and my body is delivering. For listeners and viewers, this is the same woman who feels more of a badass than when she beat Holly Holm and everyone was like, oh my God, she's a badass. <laughs> she's like, I built two kids. I'm a badass. So, you know, I just went, <laughs> once this interview was confirmed, I just went back and watched it. I was like, God, like, cause it's truly, and I'm not just saying this cause I've worked with you and I, I hold you in the highest regard. Like that is one of, cause I'm, when I joined Sirius XM, I had only been following MMA for just a few years. And that's still one of the highlights of me getting into this sport is just because again, this is what I mean. Like, it's there were such human raw moments like in that moment when you captured the title for the first time that I was like this is what I love about this sport but not not no nope, building two children is what makes you feel like a badass but I, I have to ask like to all of that like again you have a hall of fame career you fought the who's who and, and when this was confirmed I kind of went back to a question I asked Chris Cyborg last week when I said how do you get up after you know and get ready for a rematch five years removed from your first fight with Leslie Smith and she said every opponent even if they're the same opponent is a new challenge so Misha to you like you've won the belt you've fought everyone what motive like people feel like she's done it all but you feel like you can come back and, and do it even better this time absolutely without a shadow of a doubt that's how I feel that's my goal that's the ambition that's the drive is to and it's for myself I want to see what I'm truly capable of because I don't think, I think there were so many limitations that I put on myself before that I just didn't understand. It didn't have to be that way. It didn't have to be so emotionally draining. It didn't have to be so exhausting. It didn't have to be, you know, me just battling to get through a camp, um, you know, mentally and emotionally. It, didn't, it doesn't have to be that way. Like things can be so much more enjoyable. And that's the thing is I want to enjoy the process. I want to, for the first time in my career, 
do exactly that. I want to enjoy the process and I'm not going to take things for granted this time around. And I think, you know, I've got, realistically, I'm looking at two years. That's what I'm looking at. So I, I even, time is of the essence. Like I want to accomplish the most that I can in that window of time and do it the best way that I can and not be under the emotional duress that I was before, which I'm not. So, I mean, there's just so many things that I think will lend it lend themselves to me finally reaching you know that 100 percent i think one big thing i, I want to just tell people to watch you know during this second stint of your career with the ufc is that you're, you're doing so with two people that i hold in the highest regard and that's two coaches eric nixick of extreme couture who i also hold in personal high regard you know as a friend and as a person just an overall great human being and you know, I don't have the luxury to know Trevor Whitman in that same way I do Eric Nixick, but these are two coaches you have by your side. Everyone knows the tragic passing of your former coach, Robert Follis. And I think that's that's a very emotional and, and straining thing for any fighter, any person to go through, let alone no matter what the job or right. the sport is. When you have those two names, Eric Nixick and Trevor Whitman now, you know, by your side one way or another, What's that like and what does that mean to you to have those two names and every all of your coaches behind you making this run? Like I said, my support system is insane. It has exceeded my expectations, not just in my relationship, you know, with Johnny. He is, God, he's such an amazing man, you know, asked me to be his wife. He made me so happy and he continues to every single day the way the way that he delivers on everything as a father as a partner as a training partner um you know he helps in all the ways that he can and he doesn't take anything away and he doesn't expect anything in return so i mean that is so important i think you know the person who's with you and by your side that they support you then obviously you've talked about eric nixick um you know he's just man he's like the big brother you always want it. You know, he's a, he's a mentor and he's a role model and he knows how to make you laugh and he knows how to make you believe in yourself. And he knows how to, you know, I've, I always believed in myself. I definitely don't think that mentally I, I struggle in any mental capacity, but he adds more. Like who doesn't want more? Like, I don't, I want more. I want all of it. I want everything. And he makes it better. You know, sometimes I'll have just finished with the practice and I'm just kind of digesting the practice. And he's like, yo, fucking good job today. And I'm like, oh yeah, I fucking killed it today. You know what I mean? Like he just, it's more like I, he just really allows me to believe in myself and, and recognize what I'm doing. He doesn't ever just let me skip over it and just be like, yeah, you, you got through today. No, it's like you crushed. Did you know that Misha, Do you know that how good you did today? So he's, he's great. He's a great hype man. Um, and he's, he's got great coaching ability as well. And then obviously Trevor Whitman is just a mastermind of the sport. I don't think I need to really elaborate on what that man does, but <sighs> have him even just be a far what he can do to add again is adding then there's two other people i'd really like to highlight besides my mom who's just incredible and amazing but i'm going to stick with the coaches right now she's helping me with the kids and here cleaning my house i feel like i'm a child again myself because i have my mother here taking care of me but <laughs> cheers to moms they're all around the world they're so important and um but I'd like to talk about Rick Little. I feel like he's very underappreciated and very undervalued. You know, Eric's finally getting some of the credit that's due, but I feel like a lot of these coaches fly under the radar and what they're able to do and deliver. Rick Little is a, is a mastermind, actually very similar to Trevor Whitman. It's just that he just doesn't get the, the credibility. He's focused on fighter safety and a, a lot, like after working with Trevor Whitman, very similar in their coaching styles. They're about being about concepts and about being the best athlete that you can be, which is something I think very underutilized. You know, they don't teach you a move, they teach you a concept. And I, I like both of them. And I think Rick Little taking Juliana Pena from a an overweight young girl who never played sports, never wrestled, never anything, to winning the ultimate fighter against people like Shayna Baszler, who were, you know, the pioneers of the sport at the time who had tons of experience. I mean, you cannot deny what he does, the, the fighters that he produces. And if you really look into his full roster, you know what he's done with Michael Chiesa and Sam Cecilia and many other fighters who did not have a 
athletic, you know, maybe the most athletic, talented or the athletic background, but like Juliana, you know, I mean, she just came in just as a girl wanting to kind of lose some weight. She was just chubby and, and he took her down. She's fighting for a world title. I mean, it's, it's just great. So there's that aspect as well. And then I'd like to also say Jimmy Gifford. Um, yeah. He is a phenomenal boxing coach who has worked really hard to um, evolve that into the MMA game. And he's helped tremendously with my footwork, head movement and accuracy. And uh, he's also somebody who I know I can call up and if I ever needed something, you know, he's got my back. So talk about a pretty phenomenal team that I have that I'm building behind me and all the things are coming together for me to be ultra successful, which is exactly what I plan to do. Yeah, and I and I can't wait for it. That's an incredible. That's a Hall of Fame lineup of of, of support and yes. coaches you have behind you. When you took on this role of, of working at SiriusXM, you you kind of get to see things in a different light. And and you know, being you know on one side and then on the other, sometimes you you can't ask questions the same way that you would have been asked questions during you know the earlier parts of your career. Has has being on the other side, being in radio, kind of changed how you view? not maybe fighting, but how you view fighters day in and day out, even though you have been one your entire life? Uh, if, no, not really fighters. It made me um, look at interviewers, you know, people who do like what you're doing. That That's where my perception changed. I mean, I think uh, I do understand the dynamic of being a fighter on both sides of it very well. And I feel like I've always had a pretty good grip on that. But what I didn't understand was how difficult and challenging it is to be the person asking the questions, how much research goes into that, how much um, it's not just about having your bullet points in your lineup of question one, two, three, four, five. It's like, you have to have a conversation with somebody. You have to be willing and really understand it. Otherwise that conversation is not going to have the right flow to it. You're, it's going to sound robotic. You know, if you don't really know who you're talking to. So I think that's where I gained the most experience and appreciation was for the media, to be honest. All right. Well, no pressure. I just hope I didn't sound like a robot. Like no pressure at all. I was no, you're out doing before great. This. You're killing it. You definitely have a, a, a natural talent for this. Well, I appreciate that. With that being said, though, let, let's really quickly talk about your your upcoming fight and kind of what you expect. You've, you've said two years. You've already made waves. And before I talk about the fight, I have to say this. I apologize because it, it's it's me. And, and you know, I love you guys at SiriusXM. So anytime you guys do an interview, put out one of your clips. I'm usually going to write about them on one of the websites I, I write for. And it was me who wrote you praising Kayla Harrison. So which means it was my fault. You <laughs> bodied somebody on Facebook. I don't know if he's ever going to come out in the public again. <laughs> that was, I was like, I was like, oh my God, I'm, I'm, you know, I talked to your producer, Josh. I was like, yeah, I'll write it up. No problem. And then all of a sudden my boss was like, hey, dude, this article's blowing up. Look what Misha just said. And I was like, oh my God, like. It's just one of those things. I was like, oh my God, I like, I love that you were like, yeah, I had time for it that day. Yeah, I did. It just pulled up right from the algorithms. I swear, like you look at Facebook or whatever, and they know sometimes how to just piss you the fuck off. Like they just put the right thing right in front of your face. And I pull up, I'm going to post, I was getting ready to post, like minding my own business. And there's your article with that comment first front and center. And I was like, this asshole's gonna get it. Like, he's gonna get it today. He's gonna get it. And I hope he never is such an idiot again, you know? So um, I think his comment was something like, um, for those of you that haven't read it, was something like, uh, Kayla Harrison would kill me, right? Because I was asked if I would be, uh, if I'd thought about a match with her, if that's something, you know, in the future that could happen. And I said, well, to be honest, if she comes to 145, yeah, so maybe it's something that could happen in the future. So he said, Kayla Harrison would murder her kill her, um, and then also said that I couldn't get Rhonda's name out of my mouth because of course I mentioned that there would be a storyline and sort of a lineage in that Kayla and Rhonda had been training partners, right? So there's a little bit of the backstory. So when I saw this comment, I was like, I was like, you don't you don't know the first thing about kill, killing or be killed, guaranteed it. So sit back down on your couch, you potato. And I just was like, get, just get out of here with your nonsense because nobody is, wants to hear what you have to say. It, it was incredible. Did you ever reply to that, by the way? I couldn't even find it after that. I don't know where it went. No, and, and, and I have to say this, and I, and I say this. I bet he ago. didn't. I bet he didn't. Yeah, no. I, I But I hate, like, because I, I went through all the comments. There's, like, 500 comments. And I hate that, like, here you are absolutely bodying somebody and putting them in a body bag. 
and everyone's just like, Misha, I love you, Misha this, Misha that. And it's all like sex comments. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, can we please focus on the fact that she just absolutely murdered someone? So maybe you guys should watch what you're saying when you're talking to not just Misha Tate, but any woman ever, let alone a, a professional fighter and, and a world champion right. at that. I, I really wanted to go the entire interview with not mentioning her name, but since we brought up the article and it's not Kayla Harrison, I, I do want to say that I kind of hope in this r second run for you that people don't associate, they don't play like word association, meaning Misha Tate, they got to bring up somebody else. They have, like, let's just focus on Misha Tate, a, refo a, a focus, like revamped Misha Tate. Let's just make it about Misha Tate. But do you think... Misha 2.0. Exactly. Do you think this Misha Tate and everything that you set out to do, maybe even a fight against Kayla or whomever, but just coming back, reinventing yourself, being focused on just who you are as a woman, as a mother, as a fighter, could bring back the likes of Aranda? Well, I will say after I had children the second time around, distance makes the heart grow fonder. I think when you're pregnant, obviously you don't get to do a lot of the things that, uh, or I didn't, I'm going to speak for myself. I didn't obviously get to grapple, to spar, to do a lot of the things. You kind of feel like you're in a phone booth, so to speak, because you're in a it sounds so terrible to say, but it's kind of how I felt. It's like prisoner in my own body that I could not just do what I wanted to do because I had this other human to worry about, which took priority over my needs. But after nine months of that, you're, and then you've got the postpartum recovery, you know, it's almost like a year that you're kind of restrained from doing a lot of elements of the sport. Um, it makes the, you know, it definitely kind of, at least for me, lit the fire so i do think there's a potential you know after having children and plus now it's like i want i do want my kids to see firsthand what it means to be a mother who doesn't under appreciate herself and so lending so that they can appreciate that being a good mother means that mommy has to take care of herself in part so she can better take care of us and um that it's you know that I don't love them any less than that, that I don't value our time any less. But for me, it will be quality versus quantity. I don't want to be the mother that's at home all day with a child tugging on their shirt. Mommy, mommy, what? You know, you just lose it because you just, it's so much. Like I like that I can go to the gym from the, that two hours and come home and just feel refreshed and be an amazing mother who can kiss and love on my babies because I'm not just being drowned under the weight and the pressure and expectations of what a quote unquote perfect mother is supposed to do. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, anyways, I think that it's a potential, who knows, you know, Ron is a very different person than I am. And that's why I think uh, we never quite saw eye to eye, but from my own personal experience, I definitely think becoming a mother can charge you in ways that you never really understood before. And who knows how that will translate for her, but you know, um, I think she just got to focus on becoming a mommy and uh, we'll see who knows what the future holds. Well, I've heard you talk about Kayla Harrison, so no Kayla Harrison questions from me. But uh, Mary Renault, this will be her retirement fight. I'm curious, what led to the decision to fight Mary and Renault? Were there a list of names that, that were lining up to fight you? And what does it mean to that she's kind of signed on to fight you and, and you're her final opponent? So it was the name that uh, that Mick came to me with, and I just didn't care to look any further. I just thought, you know, I'm a, I'm honestly a big fan of hers. I think she's been underappreciated a lot of her career because she's been like this close to becoming a contender so many times, and she'll lose a split decision, you know. And but she's never been finished her whole career. That's insane. Who can? Who else can say that? None of, not even Amanda Nunes can say that. And right. she's been fighting in the UFC for a long time and nobody has solved the puzzle that's Marion Renault. I want to be the first one to do it. I don't just want to beat her. I want to finish her. I want to be that woman that cracks the puzzle. And to me, that's very intriguing to fight somebody who's never been finished. And you know, some people are going to look at her record and say, oh, you know, this is, you know, this is, uh, shouldn't be a tough fight. Or I don't know, maybe some people are just going to assume that because her win-loss record isn't the greatest. But if you really look at it closely, I don't view it that way at all. Like I said, she's never been finished. She's finished Sarah McMahon with a triangle choke. She finished um, 
and she hurt Sarah on the feet. She finished uh, Andrade. You know, these are women who are not, you know, they're not very easy to finish. If they lose a lot of times, it's not by finish. So I just feel like um, she's very tough and very underrated. And I think when somebody has nothing left to save for, this is her last fight. She's not saving for a next fight at, at all. Like it, this is it. I believe she's going to bring everything that she has. And I, and I welcome that because I really want to fight her knowing that when I get that finish, you know, that I fought the Marion Renault who brought her whole heart and soul into that fight and I conquered it. That's what I want to do on July 17th. You, you've you mentioned your, your children multiple times. You mentioned the fire that's brought you back. But with all this being said, you've also talked about a Kayla Harrison. You obviously want the Amanda Nunes fight back. When you talk about becoming a champion again, Misha, how much more of it is Misha Tate, the woman and the mother, and not just Misha Tate, the fighter, going, I'm going to be a champion again. Because not only is it, you know, added to your resume and your, your Hall of Fame career, but it's now I'm doing it as a mom and, and as, a, you know, a wife and, and everything that you are. Yeah. Look, the, the difference is that I know who I am. And I'm not just Misha Tate, the fighter. And I was so afraid of that before that I felt like I didn't know anything else. I had no other sense of being or purpose. And now it's like, I am Misha Tate, the fighter. I'm Misha Tate, the mother. I'm Misha Tate, the fiance. I'm Misha Tate, vice president. I'm Misha Tate, you know, the commentator. I'm all these things that I truly have a newfound sense of self-worth. And look, it takes so much pressure off because the way that I look at it is the best I can do is the best I can do. If I'm investing in myself and I'm doubling down and I'm giving 100% of Misha Tate, the best I can do is the best I can do. And I want to know what that is, you know, but God forbid, it's a crazy ass world and a crazy sport with COVID and the pandemic. And there's so many things that we've learned that sometimes there are, are, are things out of our control. And if I lost a fight, if I lose one, I still get to go home and kiss my children and hug my fiance and love my family. And so for me, going into this is all about my goals and my dreams. And I have the support of my children, my family, and that's adding to everything that I have, but this is not for them. This is for me. And I feel like doing something for me also benefits them. And so in all in all, what I guess I'm trying to say is that I feel like this is a perfect marriage of everything in my life that's going to benefit me to become the greatest in the world again. And I believe that with my whole heart and soul. And I, I just, who, I, I don't know what's going to happen July 17th, because that's what is so fun about this sport. That's what gets me up in the morning is like, you just can never guarantee success and victory. You have to believe and work hard for it and do everything within your power to control destiny but destiny will be what destiny is you know so i'm setting out for my destiny this is what i believe it is but now i have no other pressure or or what i feel like will be recourse you know if something out of my control happens you know if it's life it's going to happen all i do is prepare the very best that i can but I believe in myself. I believe in my preparation. I believe in the team that has come together. Um, and I'm just, I'm stoked. I'm stoked to see what I can do. That was, that was beautifully said, Misha. And uh, you, I know you said you're focused now on media and the interviewers. You, you're giving me something to take away with in my own personal life as we end this interview. I got to get one from, you know, Misha, the, the radio host. Uh, my first time ever going to Vegas will be in July. Uh, I'll be in Vegas a week before your fight. Uh, for yeah. UFC 264. I don't think I'm going to the fight, but, uh, you know, trying to get out there, network, and, and see what a fight week can bring me. But it's also McGregor Poirier, the trilogy. And we've seen in 2021, more than ever, I kind of liken it to 2016, where Nate Diaz came in, you shocked the world. Everyone, like, kind of flipped the MMA world upside down. It's kind of happening again this year. What happens to not just the UFC's lightweight division, but what happens to MMA overall if Connor walks away one and two in the trilogy with Dustin Poirier and, and really the stardom of Connor McGregor? That if he if he wins or if he walks if he, away? If he loses. Oh, I got you. 
Well, I mean, it will be a sad end to an era. I mean, potentially, and I say an end, I use that term loosely because I don't necessarily believe that if Connor loses, that it's the last time that we see him fight or compete. But I think we lose the we lose a lot of the appeal and we lose the, uh, with Connor losing basically the idea of him being the best and being a world champion. And that's a lot of what I think Connor honestly strove for in the beginning. And when he was going on the terror and he was, you know, knocking out Jose Aldo in 13 seconds, beating Chad Mendes, it's like, man, he's backing up what he says. People always say that you got to back up what you say. Well, if Connor loses again, it kind of, it kind of gets rid of that. So like, what then? If Conor McGregor can't align his um, image with being the very best, then what can we appreciate about Conor? Well, I think what happens then is that the best that we could hope for is for him to kind of do these one-off intriguing fights, you know, like a rematch with Diaz, um, you know, or you know how they did the BMF thing yeah. like that like yeah. something along those lines where you just get him for these spectacular in hyper interesting one-off fights that you maybe wouldn't think that you'd get otherwise that kind of a thing and i think connor could certainly still have a great appeal there and then who knows you know because Con connor if he was able to be successful in some of those you know maybe he'll change things up or move to a different weight class and get us all back on that connor mcgregor train to get to the very best again but that's kind of how I see it going if Connor doesn't, uh, if he doesn't win this fight. Well, we did a whole interview without talking about Jake Paul. You were incredibly gracious Yay. with your time. <laughs> you were so great with your time. And I just have to say, Misha, like I said to start, this was a, a, a bucket list thing for me. I've always held you in the highest regard. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for all the time you gave me. I'm so excited for you. I know, I, I know we didn't talk much because I kind of just came in, shut, kept my mouth shut, and just worked when we worked together at SiriusXM. But you can hear Misha weekly on Sirius XM channel 156 fight nation with MMA today. I believe it's Wednesdays, but if you're lucky like this it week, is. you got our Tuesday and Wednesday. Make sure you do so many great things. You're a true pioneer of the sport. When, last one, when I say that to you, not just that you're a woman's pioneer, but when you're, you're truly a pioneer of mixed martial arts, what does that mean to you? I'll tell you what, the first time that I had a parent tell me that their son looked up to me and your little boy wants to come over and take a photo with me, it really blew my mind. It honestly blew my mind because in my whole life, the way that I've always been thought of the world, right, is that women generally have to look up to women, men generally. I mean, obviously, that's how I look up to men. Sometimes women also look up to men. But there was this missing piece that I can never put together that uh, a boy, a family or a boy having a woman as an eye. And I'm sure that it's happened before. But for me, that was the first time I really experienced that. And I thought, wow, times are changing. The perception is changing. I really like this. Uh, I was really honored. You know, I think it's great that women can be role models for men and boys like. I think we had a little connection issues there at the end, but that is quite okay. Misha, thank you so, so much for your time. Like I said, I, I, I'm so grateful for this interview and uh, wish you all the best July 17th. And uh, thank, I'm thankful that you're back and I'm thankful that you're back in the way that you wanted to return. And I can't wait to see what you do in your second run in the UFC. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it.